Greetings. Welcome to a new episode of Art Matters. I'm your host, Wayne Quackenbush, and today I'll be interviewing two New England-based artists. And starting out, we're going to introduce you to Michael Cabral. I've known Michael for a number of years now, oh, ten. <laughs> initially yeah. through the Portsmouth Arts Guild. And uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, you've been very prolific and you have a uh, kind of a great story to tell about uh, your creative life and teaching. So how did you get started as an artist, do you think? It really didn't. I don't want to say it didn't start until college because I didn't take it serious until then, but always loved art, drawing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was like when I was a sophomore, something just hit me in college and I was like, okay, like I really want to do this. I want this to be my thing. And then it kind of just took off from there. Um, and then I went into teaching mainly because I thought I wouldn't make enough money being an artist. Right. Yes. And then I like it and... I can do both, and it's been, it's been a good start so far. Now, were you an education major in uh, college? So I was an art education major, mm -hmm. and when I say it like that, like the only thing I can teach is art. So when I'm at school and the kids ask me anything else, I know nothing else oh, okay. but this. <laughs> okay, but you, you kind of uh, experienced a creative spark. Yeah. When you were in the middle of your art education. Right. So I knew yeah. I wanted to do art. I knew I wanted, I, I wanted to make money. I wanted to live off of art. Mm -hmm. And now I can say I am, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Well, you've been a, um, uh, in, the, in the number of years I've known you, I've seen you go through phases of uh, artwork. And uh, I remember you initially... And you just informed me it was because of your, your master's thesis. You were working with bees. Yeah, so... As imagery. I definitely have gone through... So I started only doing collages. That was my thing. I really liked mixed media. And then I graduated. And then when I started my graduate program, I was at work one day and I just found this huge block of linoleum. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what can I do with this? And that's where the bee came from. And I kind of just started looking more into it and getting more information on it. And I just kind of ran with it. So my whole thesis is on the symbolism and artwork, but focusing on bees and artwork. And it kind of just turned into this. So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know where the bees actually came from. Well, you, you were intimating that you um, thought of bees as being uh, symbolic of the human soul. Yeah, so when I was doing my research on it, because I did arts-based research, so all of the information I found was from really ancient text about how the beehive is an idea of the human soul, the human body, the buzzing is a representation of the heartbeat, and it, it was really interesting, and it made me like fall in love with bees. <laughs> Well, I mean, in, in, in recent years, we've become, we've realized how crucial bees are to right. existence of, of uh, human beings on Earth because there wouldn't be agriculture without their pollinating um, abilities. And there's been a lot of concern about, you know, hive damage and, and uh, extinction crisis mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. So it's uh, very timely and... Um, uh, I know you, you took it a long way. You had uh, some sort of a, a bell jar with an actual hive in it. Yeah, so my mother-in-law raises bees um, on her farm, and she gave me this really beautiful piece of black honeycomb, and it's mm -hmm. about that big. Mm -hmm. And so I took that, and she gave me a pile of dead bees that she had, mm -hmm. and I just like articulated it all together. And yeah, it's actually one of my favorite things I've ever made, and it sits in my house, and... I, I love that piece a lot. So, yeah, and now that I'm getting older and I'm still doing it, I'm moving away from the bees, even though I love them, um, and just kind of trying to find something new to do right now. I, I, I kind of like trying a little bit of everything. So mm -hmm. right now I've been really more into painting, but I still do um, the carvings 
like I said, like well, once a year. Well, you can start by showing your, your artwork. Yeah, and so. I mean, I know that a lot of stuff that you were showing recently show is um, first. Pop, cult, pop culture references. Yeah. So. And then you have a whole... Um, you have a whole bird thing happening now. So put that there, yep. and right there is perfect. There we go. So that's that's a, a recent, now is that a linoleum cut? So it is, so this stamp and then my one back here, <clears throat> the same stamp, and that's the stamp I use for everything through my graduate program. I just took this one that I made and I made probably about 50 different pieces of it. And then this one is one that I just painted into. The That one right here, which I can yeah. grab, um, is probably the more original, what it looks like. And then I used alcohol ink to fill them in. Right. Like I said, this one was painted, but painting really isn't, or wasn't my thing until really recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hated it throughout college, but as I'm practicing, I'm liking it more. Um, now, are you using coat? You're using paint a lot of the times as kind of a, a fill-in for a rub. Yeah, um, definitely am. For, for a color. Um, and, uh, you know, using that to make a statement. Right. So for all of these two, like I have multiple versions of all of these. Right. You um, can show one at a time there. And I have a colored version of each of them mm -hmm. that I, I hand color. So right now, the thing I'm working on is human anatomy and focusing on that. So I'm doing a lot of things with intestines and brains and looking at anatomy and, and reimagining it. And uh, the manifestation of the um, body as a as a physical presence. Uh, and, each part of its own. Um, you, like people talk about the intelligence of, of your gut. You know, your um, bacteria inside your body and um, part of your own. Uh, I did, I just finished a brain painting, like of a bilateral dissection of a brain, mm -hmm. but it has eyes in it. <laughs> of course. Because I like imagining this like fake world where everything is like these bright colors and like the insides are all the same, like bright pinks and things like that. Well, but then there's you, these bright white eyes staring back at you. You could be making these things in 3D. I thought of it. Yeah. Yeah, I really have thought of it. And then um, you could get like uh, glass eyes and insert them. I never, maybe I should do that. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? <laughs> Absolutely. I've never, yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> I already use dead bees in a ton of work, so maybe it's time to start using some well, fake eyes. Well, you know, eyes. you work with plasticine at work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool to mold. Yep. Yeah. And so, the Sculpey and all that. Um, and then this is my last print. So like I told you before, I only do about one of these a year. I carve one um, and then print it because I really plan these out before I do them. So it takes me a long time to plan everything to really see where I'm going with it. Um, so that's all my yeah my carvings I call now, them. This is uh, this looks like uh, some sort of beetle and yep. and I'm kind of you know not up on my. <laughs> my insects um I think this it looks one is to a me goliath. it looks like a scarab of some this sort this one's a goliath beetle i believe uh-huh yeah and does that have any symbolic uh representation to this you? one kind of just came to me one, at one point and i was i made a actually out of plasticine mm -hmm. i made a, a a model of this but bigger probably like six inches or seven inches something like that and then I was like, well, I wasn't really liking it. And I was like, you know what? Let me sketch one out. And then it just turned into this. I was like, you know, I'm going to carve it. And then mm -hmm. I 
ended up with that, yeah. And then for paintings, which is what I've been doing more of, I'll put this one down. Yep, yep. Again, like I'm sticking with the theme of the eyes, but I've been doing, I do kind of a mix of things. Like I'm almost like a jack of all trades. Yeah, well, you I've, said that you were in, when you're teaching, you're trying to get the children you work with to try everything that they can. Yeah, and I, like I said, I do this with them. Like I do this at my desk while I'm at school. They see what I do and I'm thinking it's a good thing. They always mm -hmm. seem to enjoy it. Um, they're always interested in what I'm doing and so they're yeah, always I'm sure like, it's an inspiration. Well, they always say to me, like, how can you do this? And I'm like, well, it didn't just happen. Like, this is like years and years of trying things and things not working and failing at it before. Yeah, of course, of you course. Know, and they, they can't see it that way. They think you wake up and you're born and you're uh, able to. Yeah, <laughs> to kids are obsessed with perfection and they think yeah. that when they make something, it's going to be perfect as, as right. soon as they render it. And, and they don't see all the torn up paper you have in your trash or whatever. Yeah, you use. They, they really don't. So when they see me doing it, like this, I have my original version of this painting, which mm -hmm. is really bad. So I painted over it and I did it again and then I painted over it again. And where do you get these hot colors? What, what is this? Is this acrylic? This is all acrylic. Yeah, I, I did oil a little bit in college, but I really am fine with acrylic. Mm -hmm. I think it's easier. That's just me. And then for the color choice, like I just really love pink yeah. and yellow. Like my whole house, every room in our house is pink. Well, this it pops and so vibrates. So this, yeah, there's something about the color that just mm -hmm. I really just love. So I always use pink now, and almost like I go through a lot of pink tubes. <laughs> sure. But yeah, and then my last one here. Now your now your acrylics um, is good for flat colors. Yeah. And, um, and even in in this, you're actually. Uh, you have color separation, and um, you can see the where the the different um, tones are. Yeah, and there's and a, there's lines of demarcation. My goal last year, my New Year's resolution, I'll call it, was becoming a better painting painter, painter. because mm -hmm. I hated it. I really didn't like. I yep. didn't like my professors when I was in school, and I just turned me off to the idea. But I was always so jealous of people that could paint. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm a good painter now because I'm still learning, but I have had more fun making art in the past year than I have ever because I'm kind of just letting things go and doing what I want. And there's also a lot to be said and people who don't paint can't even understand it unless, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's like, oh yeah, I painted my bedroom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the feel of the brush onto the surface, whether it's wood or canvas and seeing that color spread out, it's a whole sensual experience. It's, it, 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 you're right. It, it, I, being able to take an idea out of my head and putting it onto this piece of wood. Oh yeah, you has, can feel the, the light just pops yeah. in your head. So it's been great and you know, I've actually been trying to sell work and not that I like, I, if someone wants something, I think it's awesome. So I'm mm -hmm. more willing to be like, just take it for whatever you have kind of person. Cause I'm not making my art for anybody. Yeah. But it is for anybody that wants it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and you get to share it and you get to share your ideas and the one thing that happens when you make a lot of artwork is you find that you have to find room for it. Yeah, well, that's what I'm, my house is getting a little too small right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so you're very happy to find a new home. Yeah, so. Is this a self-portrait? This is, which I don't typically do, but something, I had a dream and then I woke up and I had the idea, wrote it down, and then it turned into this five repaints later. That's amazing. All right, well, we ran out of time, so I just want to thank you for well, coming by you. and thank you for sharing your artwork. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it as always. All right. So we're here with our second artist, um, Penny Carrier. Welcome to the show. I've known you for a couple years now through the Portsmouth Arts Guild. And you're, you've been one of the more enthusiastic members and board members at the Guild. And I know that you help with the um, website, keeping that up and running and do all sorts of things with social media. And uh, you're a very prolific pr proselytizer, I would say. <laughs> so thanks for coming today. My and uh, when did your 
um, interest in art start? Well, I really always love going to museums and looking at paintings and sculpture, um, but I never thought I had any talent. Mm -hmm. uh, I retired and took care of my grandchildren, and then my husband got um, a short stint with the Pentagon, and we were in D.C. Mm -hmm. And after I had gone to all these wonderful museums, I was inspired, and I ordered a few uh, water color tools online and went on YouTube and just started painting. Oh, so you initially started by um, getting tutorials from YouTube? <laughs> I and loved then, YouTube, and yeah. And then I know that you're a, a huge fan of the classes that uh, the Portsmouth Arts Guild offers. I love them. It <laughs> has been like a world of difference for me. Yeah, I just used to paint flowers and then they opened up a whole new world. Well, you can show us some of the some yeah, of the so early things. These were my YouTube uh, tutorials. Mm -hmm. uh, I would do strictly flowers, mm -hmm. but um, I loved them, and they were really pretty. And I thought they showed the translucence of the watercolor. Mm -hmm. And then I have some daffodils. Now, so of course, watercolors are uh, uh, you you can they're very delicate, and you build up color with them. Um, you yes. basically trying to let as much of the white show through as you can um, while maintaining the, the hues. That's right. And um, you were taking a number of classes and, and participating in the uh, plein air uh, that they do pretty much every week. I did, and that has been my biggest challenge, to be honest with you, because I was a very slow and precise uh, painter. Mm -hmm. And when we would go on location in plein air, we had a very short window yes. and we had to complete. So that has, I think, made me uh, a much freer and looser artist. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to like really fret about every detail, mm -hmm. but I found that um, plein air has really helped me to kind of loosen up and not worry about the small stuff and it all sort of comes together. You know what is a good cure for that? Trying to paint with the wrong hand. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I always recommend that. Yeah, I should try that, actually. Yeah. I don't think I have. I don't know <laughs> if I have it in me. Well, um, you know, it, it's... Uh, so I, I had no idea that it was required that you're supposed to finish a painting when you go out in the field. Well, I think the true plein air purists consider it only plein air when they start and complete. Mm -hmm. the painting during that plein air session. Mm -hmm. I like to say mine are always partial plein air. Yeah. Because I get a good start, but then I always have to complete it back at home. Well, I know people <laughs> that go out into the field and uh, will start a painting and, and progress to a certain extent and then take pictures. Yes. And then go back in the studio and, and complete it that way. Yes, yes. But there is something freeing about working in the raw, so to speak, and uh, uh, giving yourself a deadline. True. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel it's made me um, a better artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I'm still a detailed person. Yeah. 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 Now, you can probably start showing us, because you have a lot of work to show. Well, uh, so if you want to hold up some pieces. Sure. And, and I can show you my. Some of my partial plein air, as I like to call them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this was, whoops, this was one that we did, um, the Whitehall. No, making sure he can see it. Yeah, no. I hope, yeah. And so I'm not in the way. Better? Yeah, that yeah. looks good. Yeah, so, um, yeah, this was at the Whitehall Mansion in Middletown. But it was in the back, you know, they have that big red home, and that's what everybody thinks of. But in the back, there was this lonely little cabin that I just fell in love with, so... Yeah, I'm very familiar with that area. I live about 700 feet away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> then you must know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. So that's probably um, my only, although this was another partial plein air, I should say. Um, and this was Linden Place in um, Bristol. Uh-huh. And um, I started it, and then... Uh, I took a few classes with Gina Croce. Oh, yes. And uh, she is like the most magnificent detail person around. I and mean, how do you get the, my first question is, how do you get the uh, lattice work to drop out over the lintel there? The, you know, those... Uh, oh, like the spider web? Yeah. Uh, 
You know, everybody um, I've talked to uses white gouache. I find, though, that it kind of, like, the colors will bleed through, particularly I was on black. Yes. I use white ink. Okay. And a brush. And I know Gina uses a mask. Yes, but uh, I didn't use a mask on that. No, I, I used was, white that's ink. What, that's what yeah. made me uh, curious, because yeah. it's very clean, those lines. Yeah. Yeah. So that was fun. Um, so back to some of the classes that I've taken. Mm -hmm. um, which has been great because it's really shown me a lot of new techniques that I was unaware of, particularly in drawing. I wanted to improve my drawing. Mm -hmm. I feel like in watercolor, um, a good sketch is really the backbone of your painting. Yeah, you're the skeleton. So, so I really feel that I wanted to improve. And I took a class um, offered by the Guild, which was wonderful, Kelly McCullough. Mm -hmm. And she taught this technique called um, sight size. Yeah, the measuring thing. It <clears throat> is, and it was like so incredible. And I'm not what I don't consider myself a great artist, but this is what I was actually able to produce mm -hmm. in Kelly's class, mm -hmm. which I'm very proud of. <laughs> and you actually had the uh, sculpture there in front of you. Exactly, and, and it's right at your eye level, which is important. So explain how the sight size would work then. So what happens is she had a bust uh, of this, and she mm -hmm. um, put it on one side of the easel, mm -hmm. and it's at your eye level. And then you, you stand like about three feet back, mm -hmm. and you make an X on that spot where you're going to be actually drawing. And you look at the sculpture, or whatever you're trying to draw, and you have a string. Mm -hmm. And then at that exact level, you move the string over to your easel, you see where that is, you walk up and you make a mark. And then you start again and you look. And so at first you just get the height. Then you try to get the width. It's very um, tiny little marks which eventually come together. I mean, it works. So it's like, um, <laughs> it's kind of like a very sophisticated version of Connect the Dots. Kind of. Yeah. It, and I could see, you know, you were just telling me about how you have a background in IT. Yes. And you're and you're always you're always dealing with every single pixel on a screen. Right. I could see how that could really appeal to you. Oh, it did. <laughs> to make that really that grid work. Yes. Yes, yes it did. Boy, so that this must was be so satisfying. It was, and I was just so happy when it came together. You know, mm -hmm. I just, I, I was in love. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it, and it was very successful. Now, have you, have you used it since, though? Well, that's interesting, though. No. Ah. But I think I'm going to give it a shot. Well, because you're, there's a whole, a whole school of landscape uh, painters at the guild. So right. that's what a lot of people seem to be into at the moment. Exactly, yeah. and particularly when you do plein air. No, you can do that. You can use the same technique uh, out in the field. You know, you could. You know, you could even take a, a piece of glass and grid it out and put that in front of your uh, landscape and then reproduce the grid onto your canvas. Hmm. Right? I never thought of that. <laughs> We may have a whole new technique, Wayne. There you go. Wow, I think pretty that, awesome. that Vermeer, one of the Dutch painters, used to do, yes, do that. Yes, exactly right. He yeah. used lenses to project. I mean, they were full of tricks, those guys. Interesting, yeah. wasn't it? And you thought it was all just natural ability. Yeah. They well, had technique. Those guys were tight, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very, very precise. Very precise. And we got to keep moving because yes. uh, time is fleeting, so you want to keep, you know, show, um, show some more stuff. I would oh, kind of like talk to talk those. about this. Um, that was one of the things I struggled <coughs> with in um, watercolor was value. Mm -hmm. And being able to build up value, as you said, you know, you have to keep building it up. And, mm -hmm. you, and there's really, you have to have the light and darks. And so a lot of people said to do a value study where you only use one color. Right. So we had an exhibit at the Guild, which was um, Reimagine Color. Yes. And my goal was to do the same drawing of the same sculpture, which is um, at Linden Place in Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, I had originally wanted to do all three primary colors, but I never got to yellow. But I did do the um, red, and I did do the blue. And what I found so fascinating was it really gave me a feel for value. Yes. And I'm amazed that when you do something in one color, it sets a mood. Yes, absolutely. This guy is like so much grumpier looking in the blue, I mm -hmm. think, than, 
the, the warm color, and I, I just found the whole thing with value, this whole study that I did. Yeah, it's, it, the color, color works emotionally, too. Yeah, yeah, it was a good learning experience yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. So that was that. And, and some more plein air. What's I did. I took um, both of Bill um, Lane's classes in plein air. He's mm -hmm. like the plein air guru around here. Mm -hmm. And I was just so pleased. I mean, I actually, this is a true, I don't know, I think I got something on it, which is unfortunate. It's my masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the one time I actually did a plein air, start to finish. It's very evocative. And I just loved it. I just, I was so happy. <laughs> yeah, you get uh, all of the, you got to play a little bit. You let to let the, the, the color move. Yes. And... Um, gradate into the sky and in the background and uh, exactly your uh, foliage and the reflection in the water it's very cool I love it I do I was happy with it and then this is one other one that I did with um, Bill during his class as well and this was um, actually in Common Fence Point right almost right near um, Common, Point, Common Fence Point Community Center along the water oh yeah uh-huh sure so Another one that I actually finished. <laughs> now, was he teaching watercolor, or could you use any medium, or did he have a, was it structured? He, he does do watercolor, strictly okay. watercolor, I think, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think if any of the students uh, worked in oil and oil. I think most people that take his class are watercolor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty cool. I think people pretend, uh, tend to like um, acrylics when they're out in the field more, but, the, but uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, because they dry so fast. And I did want to give a shout out to a class I took with Gina at the Guild. Once yes. again, so many wonderful classes at the Guild. Such a great deal. Um, and I never thought And there's thought a I website. <laughs> Yes, oh yes, and I manage the website, please. PortsmouthArts.org. Yes. It's PortsmouthArts.org, yes, right. yes. Uh, so I never thought I could do a portrait, mm -hmm. ever. And um, Gina proved that with the right instruction, you can. Now for the unenlightened, tell us who that is. Uh, it's Frida, and of course now I'm having a senior moment, I can't think of her last oh, name. Oh yeah, Kalo. Kalo. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> So, yeah, we all did this portrait, and it was great. And then I was so confident after I took this that my daughter-in-law asked me to do a picture of my two grandchildren in the tub. Mm. And uh, I did it, and it came out great. I don't have it to show because yeah. I gave it to no, them. No, of course, yeah. yeah but. And um, she has a unique way of building up color, too. Yes, she does. So there's not a... Um, what you would call peach or something. What what did you use for skin tone? And yeah, that? so we start with yellow. Mm -hmm. We paint the face and you try to do the contours in a deeper yellow, mm -hmm. but the entire face is covered in yellow. And then you add a more of a coral tone on top mm -hmm. of that. But yeah, that's and how you, it and starts. And you build it up from the edges. Exactly. And, and, uh, exactly. and then you get dark for the shadows. Yes, and, uh, yes. She's very precise, like in the hair. You work on, like, each little section of the braid at a time. Yeah, she yeah. paints. Well, we're running out of time, so I want to thank you My so much for coming. I've been trying to get you here for a long time. Thank, thank you. you for coming to the show. Thank you. And that wraps us up for another episode of Art Matters, and we'll see you next time.